delighted, very delighted to have been asked to be here with you this morning. And um, I want to echo um, the, uh, the appreciation for Tim. Uh, he has been, he's my slightly older brother, and um, which meant in addition to us being um, close relationally, I was always a year behind him in school. So at almost every uh, venue of school that we traversed together, from elementary school to high school, um, I was known as Tim's brother. So wherever I went, it was, oh, you're Tim's brother. And sometimes I didn't know exactly what that implied, good or bad, but it was always, um, an, it, you know, it was, a, it was a good thing. So, um, and I want you to know that my brother Tim loves you dearly. He has such a place, a big place in his heart for each of you and for this ministry and for the work that each of you do. And he, he loves you, he brags about you, um, and I have been hearing about this group for a, a long time. <clears throat> and um, so I am I'm very pleased, uh, honored to be with you today. Um, let me start with, with first a, a great appreciation for, one, for the song that was sung, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a messed up person like me. And we're going to talk about um, being messed up. Yeah. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about purpose. In uh, my home church, um, I uh, am one of the leaders of our of our adult Sunday school class of people my age. So my age is like 65 to 85 or, or beyond. So we are in that group of people. And one of the things that happens as you go through life is that you get to a point where you think, well, I now deserve to retire. I get to retire. And we all do that, and we work to it, and that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But God does not call us into retirement, yes. ever. And um, that's why I appreciate this ministry, and I appreciate the fact that God has work for us to do, even though we mess up. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about that subject, messing up forgiveness, and then, then the work that God has us to do. So Tim uh, mentioned that um, we were uh, privileged to grow up in a, uh, in a Christian home. Our parents were Christian. And part of our routine as a family, and I recall this so well as a, as a little kid, was to go to church every Sunday morning, and sometimes in the morning and in the evening. Now, at, that, at this point in our lives, we lived in Pasadena, but we went to church in Los Angeles, uh, which meant that we would um, pile into our 1949 Chevy sedan, four-door sedan, and there were six of us, my parents and four kids, uh, three of us sat in the back bench, and my parents were in the front, and in between our, my parents was our little sister, who sat in one of these car seats that hooked over the back of the front seat. And you remember these things, these chrome hooks that hook over the back. The kid sits there, maybe with a little steering wheel, but just, sometimes just sitting there, no seat belts, and that was a perfect launch point for the kid to go flying forward <laughs> if there was any type of accident. But that's what it was. That's, what we, that's, what, um, that's the way it was. Tim and I and our, and our older sister, Merlin, we sat in the back. And um, we went on the Pasadena Freeway, the Aurora Parkway back then. Um, and we took that drive. 
And I remember as a little kid um, making that drive and as our dad merged onto the newly built Harbor Freeway, so now you think how long ago this was, Harbor Freeway, newly built, Pasadena Freeway merges onto the Harbor Freeway. We could look over to the side of Los Angeles now and we could see the church that we were gonna to go to from the freeway because it was a big church. It was 13 stories tall and it was on the corner of 7th and Hope in downtown Los Angeles. And on the top of that church, there were two massive signs, huge signs. And each sign had two words. And I've got a picture on my computer of the church, and I'll show it to you. This is what we saw every Sunday as we merged and got close to this church that we were, that we're going to. And this is the Church of the Open Door, downtown L.A. This is the original home of Biola. They met there uh, on that campus. And as a little kid, we would see those words and we thought, well, okay, you know, that, that is, I don't know what that means for sure, but that's, those are big signs and big words. Must be important. Must be important. And our pastor at that time was J. Vernon McGee. Yeah. And we were, we were privileged, and we didn't know how privileged we were to actually be in that audience. And yet, um, he was our pastor. Now, once you got inside um, the church, it, it didn't look like a church. It looked like a building. And the uh, sanctuary didn't look like a sanctuary. It looked like a, uh, a, an auditorium. And, and it was. On the outside were the words, Jesus saves. On the inside, as you sat there and looked at the platform, there was, of course, the platform and where the speaker stood. And then behind the platform was a huge map of the world. Big map of the world with lights where the missionaries from that church were. And then there was a big banner or a big, um, yeah, a big banner on top of the arch that covered that whole front stage. And this is what that banner said. And if you can read it, it says, all have sinned. So on the outside, it said, Jesus saves. And on the inside, we are reminded that all have sinned. Now, we were young, but those words kind of were part of our early Christian experience. I became a Christian. I turned my life over to Jesus when I was a teenager. So it, it, it didn't um, happen right away when I was young, but there was a point where those words took hold in my life. So I stand here before you to say this to you. I am Tim's brother. I'm also a physician, um, licensed by the state of California, board certified in a specialty, and my specialty is obstetrics and gynecology. Now, that is um, a medical specialty. I went to school for probably 13 years to learn to do what I did as a physician. Um, but what it is, is obstetrics is taking care of women who are pregnant, and gynecology is taking care of women in general. Their anatomical, physiological, endocrinological, emotional, relational needs. That's what I did, and that's what I still do today. And I was once asked, 
Why did you do, why did you become a gynecologist? Why didn't you become a general surgeon or an ENT doctor or family practice? Why did you become a gynecologist? And, and I think about that and I go, well, one reason is I, I had this hope. You see, I, um, I married my, my childhood sweetheart, actually my high school sweetheart. Uh, the second best decision I ever made in my life was to ask Susie to marry me. The first best decision I ever made in my life was to give my heart to Jesus. But the second one was to ask Susie to marry me, and, and she did say yes. And I thought to myself, well, I need to try to understand her better. So maybe if I went to medical school and specialized in women, I would have a better understanding of my wife. <laughs> I can tell you <laughs> that even with all that academic background, I still have no clue <laughs> as to... <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> But it's been a delight, and, and she definitely has uh, been my, um, my helpmate throughout life. And we, Susie and I, have uh, five uh, children, four of whom are adopted. Um, one of our five children has, as an adult now, with special needs. So we have had a, a, quite a, a journey in parenting. But we've done it together, and we've done it with the, with the, really with the grace of God walking with us every step of the way. I was asked why I wore this coat this morning and why I seem to be overdressed, and I, I said, this is what Susie put out for me to wear. So that is why, that is why. <laughs> so I am Tim's brother. I am a board-certified um, gynecologist. And part of the work that I do now is I am the medical director of Lifeline Crisis Pregnancy Support Services in San Luis Obispo County. So I work with a, uh, a pro-life pregnancy support group. I run their clinical services, their imaging services, and I'm uh, in, in charge of their, their laboratory quality. So that, that's what I do now. That's one of the things that I do now. And I'm so grateful that God has called me into this ministry. But more importantly, I am a sinner saved by grace. And I would like to share with you a story um, of someone else who was a sinner, who failed miserably, who messed up, and yet, because of the grace of God, found forgiveness and purpose and was put to work. And we are here today partly because of that person. Easter is coming, so it's, it's before us now. Easter is a time where <clears throat> we as the family of faith worldwide celebrate the redemptive plan of God being worked out through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. About six weeks or so before the crucifixion event, Jesus began to move his group from where he had been ministering at the, around the Sea of Galilee down towards Jerusalem. So it was a journey, and there are many stories that have to do with that journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem in preparation, in preparation of what Jesus knew was coming. And part of that group that was with Jesus was Peter, Apostle Peter. And he is one of my favorite people in the Bible. We all need to have in our lives people who we appreciate and who we admire. My brother is someone I admire um, greatly. 
Um, we have personal heroes. Other personal heroes of mine would be Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, great Civil War uh, officer, at the, particularly at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, Mother Teresa is a hero of mine. And Peter is a hero of mine. And Peter, I believe, likes to tell a story. And I think that his favorite story, and I think it's his favorite story because it's found in all four Gospels, is the story of his colossal failure. And we know that story, but I want to review with it with you today because I myself am personally impacted by this. So I think that Peter likes to tell the story about his sin of betrayal of his, of his Redeemer in order to remind us of God's forgiveness for each of us. And I think we all need that. He wants us to learn from our failures. And he wants us to find the redemption that he found. It's a familiar story, but it's a surprising story when you think about it. Peter, as you know, was one of the first called Peter was a member of the inner circle. Peter, this big fisherman, impulsive, brash, having somewhat unfiltered thinking and certainly unfiltered behavior, was the first one in the history of humanity to declare that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, I've read that story so many times that the impact of it kind of goes, I don't, I don't appreciate it. But think about it. Jesus was the first one to ever say, you are the Messiah. Now, we use the word Christian and Jesus Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. Christ is Greek. Messiah is Hebrew. And the word Messiah means anointed one. So Jesus is the anointed one of God. And Peter was the very first one to say that. I like the word Messiah. The word Messiah implies anointment. And in, in the Old Testament... That word shows up in another context that I like to put together. And the other context of the word anoint has to do with the warriors of the day carried shields. Those shields were heavy, made of wood and covered with leather. And the leather had to be kept supple. So they would anoint the shield with oil to keep that shield ready for battle. We're told that Jesus is our shield. And I thought, that is just such a great pairing up of the word Messiah, that he is our shield and he is anointed. And I just thought that was cool. I wanted to share that with you. Um, Peter was the one who avowed his undying loyalty to Jesus. You recall that Jesus said, you're going to deny me. And Peter stands up and says, even if everybody else denies you, I won't. I won't. And Jesus looks at him and says, you will. But deny, deny Jesus, Peter did. And it was a surprising sin, a surprising betrayal of trust, it was basically walking away from someone who you said that you would die for. When we look at acts of treachery, we realize that turning your back, being basically a Judas-type person, is a treasonous behavior 
that is among the worst sins that you can commit. But Peter found himself in that position. When I look at that behavior of Peter in the garden, when they came to arrest Jesus, I see a brave man who pulls out his sword, takes a swipe at the, at the uh, servant of the high priest, cuts off the servant's ear, and Jesus says to him, put away your sword. I've got this. Jesus is arrested. He's taken into the um, courtyard of the high priest, and there he is interrogated by the high priest. Waiting right outside are two disciples, one of whom is Peter. And it's at, it's at this point in time that the subtleness, the subtleness of Peter's sin begins to become evident. I think that if, as in the garden, if it was a frontal attack, Peter would take out a sword and defend Jesus. But Satan is more subtle than that. Satan knows our weaknesses. Satan knows how to get to us. So there was no frontal attack here in the courtyard. It was a maid at the gate that says to Peter, weren't you with him? Weren't you with Jesus? And Peter says, nope, wasn't me. You all may remember <clears throat> several years back during the Cold War that <clears throat> there was that there were Marines who were responsible for guarding the embassy um, in Moscow who were involved in um, espionage against the American government. Do you remember that? Do any of you remember that? So the Marines that were responsible for protecting the embassy had subtly become engaged in espionage behavior against America. They were eventually found out and they were arrested. I'm convinced that if those same Marines were at the door of the embassy and a mob was attacking the embassy, they would have defended that embassy. But it wasn't that at all. It was a subtle um, winning over of the couple of the Marines by Soviet female agents who got to them. That was their weakness. And so I think with Peter, if there had been, as in the garden, a direct assault against Jesus, he would have stood his ground and made a stand. But sin in our lives often starts very subtly. Again, Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows how to get to us. He knows where we think we have enough internal fortitude to stand against sin. And he goes, oh, that's pride of life. I know how to get to that person. But Peter did sin. Um, it's a surprising sin. But what I love about Peter is that this big fisherman with calloused hands, impulsive behavior, and rather unfiltered speech had a very tender heart. When Jesus came out of the door of the chief where the high priest was, Back into the courtyard, there was Peter. And every account says the same thing, that Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter immediately repented. Again, I, like, I think Peter likes to 
wants us to know this story. It's found in all four Gospels. It's even found in the Gospel of Mark. Now, why is that important? It's important because behind the narrative of the life of Jesus recorded in Mark is the testimony of Peter. Peter was the one who told Mark what to say. And so Mark says, Peter messed up. Peter failed. But Jesus comes out, looks at him, and immediately, immediately, Peter repents. When I was driving down <clears throat> um, yesterday afternoon, uh, particularly when I get um, on uh, uh, the 15, and I look off to the side at this time of the year, we, get, we begin to see the California poppies. And they're, they're beautiful. And as you know, the California poppy is our state flower. And I think of the California poppy, and I think, I want to be like that. And you go, what? What does that mean? Well, the California poppy, as you know, at night, when it's dark, closes up. The California poppy closes itself against the darkness. And it opens itself to the light. And I think that's how God wants us to be. Be closed to the darkness and be open to the light. And that's what I see in Peter. Because even though Satan is subtle and we are weak, we know that Christ offers forgiveness and redemption. So, the, the story of Peter's failure is, does not end with that at all. Um, we know that Jesus met with Peter after his failure. Thank you. <laughs> so <clears throat> after, after Peter's colossal failure, Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection, we don't know the details of their meeting. It's alluded to in 1 Corinthians where Paul says that Jesus and Peter had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And wouldn't you have loved to have been there and listened to that? I can just get a sense that Jesus took Peter by the arm, said to him, we need to have a cup of coffee because I've got work for you to do. As I mentioned, Peter was given a job to do. He failed miserably. He was forgiven. And Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. Tend my flock. I've got work for you to do. Yes, you messed up. We all mess up. None of us bat a thousand. And we know that Peter took that and ran with it. Peter preached the first sermon of the Christian era. When you think about it, that's pretty remarkable. He was the first one to declare that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the first one to preach in the Christian era. And because of that sermon, 3,000 people became Christian. Peter was also the first missionary. It's because of his missionary vision that we're here today. Um... That just tells me that there is no sin that God cannot forgive. So I'll say that again because it speaks to me. There is no sin that God will not forgive. 
with contrition, repentance, acceptance of forgiveness, God has work for all of us to do. Even at, at our more advanced years, God has work for, do, for, for us to do. Um, this speaks to me because at this point in my life, I have changed what I do in terms of practicing medicine. But I still believe that God has a, a plan for, for me and a plan for you. So we want to be like that poppy that opens to the light. And we want to have that heart that says, yes, I do mess up, but with God's grace, amazing grace, he can save a messed up person like me. And um, I just praise him for that. <clears throat> so um, with that, I want to thank you for letting me come and talk to you. Uh, it's been an honor. Uh, I hear so many amazing stories that my brother shares with me about the work that you are doing. And um, I'm grateful for this ministry. Um, I'm grateful for a group of men who honor their wives, who honor their commitment to their family, because that's where it starts. God has called us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And Tim reminded me last night that just as the church has not been easy for God to love over time, Think of all the times and ways the church messes up. We love our wives even when they are not perfect. The church is not perfect. God loves the church. Christ died for the church. We love our wives as Christ loved the church. And so um, thank you for that call to this ministry. I appreciate each of you very, very much. So let me uh, close with a word of prayer. Um, so Father, I would just want to thank you for this group of men. I thank you that they are standing in the gap in a culture and in a world that has increasingly gone off the rails. But they are looking to you. They are looking to you for, for guidance, for strength, and for purpose. And Lord, I want to thank you that you've all that, that you have forgiven us each one, that you have given us work to do, and through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, you are allowing us to do that work in our families, in our communities, um, and in the world. Um, so thank you very much. We praise you for who you are. We love you. We honor you. We fall down and we worship you. So be with us this day as we go into this world that you died to save, that you came to redeem, and help us to be those ambassadors of hope and uh, comfort to a lost world. We thank you that you are going to help us do this through the power of Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray, amen. <laughs>